Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the hearts of Westminster. Now, it was the Conservative Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, who said that the NHS is the closest thing the English people have to a religion. And today, well, it really felt like it. In what other country would politicians gather in Westminster Abbey to wish the health service a happy 75th birthday? But should today be about celebration, hand on heart? Is the NHS really offering a good standard of care? We'll be discussing on the show today as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. And we have some top guests for you on the programme today, including the Shadow Minister, Luke Pollard, and his personal experience of the NHS. Plus, as nearly every railway ticket office is set to close, we'll speak to Peter Pendle, the General Secretary of the TSA, TSSA Union, and much more besides on the take. Good evening. Well, from mortgages to Wimbledon protests, it's been another busy few days in Westminster. So let's crack on straight on, shall we? We're going to start with the best bits of the week so far. The heads of some of Britain's biggest banks have been called into a meeting by the financial regulator to address allegations of blatant profiteering. We can see the problem here. The purple line is the Bank of England base rate, up from almost zero to 5% in 18 months. That's seen mortgage rates, the orange line, Bolt up too. The Prime Minister has been trying to defend his record during a testy session before MP. This is a Prime Minister under acute pressure. He set out uh, five pledges to the British people but six months ago. And now, when it comes to every single one, uh, he's under serious pressure uh, to deliver. You, you chose not to be there, didn't you? Uh, that's no, that's twice. Chose, on two I... rule breaking moments, you chose not to be in Parliament. But I... yesterday, you opined on the rules of cricket. Uh, I, Take I, us I, through that. Uh, I... The NHS turned 75 today, but on what is an historic day, three leading health charities have warned that underinvestment and short-term fixes over the past decade have put the service's future at risk. The pressures for the NHS are here and now. This emergency department recorded its busiest ever day just a few weeks ago. Wimbledon uh, has been disrupted, certainly play on court number 18 has. We can show you some uh, pictures from a little bit earlier. This was when two Just Stop Oil protesters uh, got onto the court. I'm glad to see the right honourable gentleman here today. I think I'm right in saying that I have the pleasure again next week, two weeks on the trot. They really have given up. <laughs> every day, every day, 4,000 families' mortgages deals expire, 100,000 more since we last met, and millions more next year. Families are sick with worry about the cost of the Tory mortgage bombshell. It may come as a surprise to the Right Honourable Lady, but actually some leaders trust their deputies to stand in for them. <laughs> and when it comes to mortgage rates, I support the independence of the Bank of England. Another battle of the uh, deputies. I'm still getting used to those two going up against each other. I'm not sure. Something I haven't quite got my head around it yet. Uh, anyway, we are mixing up the programme a bit tonight. And our main interview today is with Labour, the party who, the polls suggest, uh, will form the next government. So we can talk now to Luke Pollard, the Shadow uh, Defence Minister. Thanks so much for being on the programme uh, today. It's great to have you. Um, now, usually with these interviews, I'd start off with policy or the mm. big news stories of the day, but it is the anniversary of the formation of the NHS. So I kind of thought we'd kind of rip the rule book up slightly because you've had your own experience with the NHS recently, uh, haven't you? I think you went mm. to the GP about a, a bump on your arm. That's why you first went there, right? It was, yeah. My other half had uh, got a bit annoyed with me that I had a bump on my arm and I didn't know what it was. And he said, you've got to go to your GP and get it sorted out. As it turned out, when I went to the GP, the bump on the arm was just skin doing what skin does. A bump on the arm. Yeah. Exactly. But then there was something on my face. I don't know, they pointed at me. And although in great makeup in Sky News, you can't quite see it, I had a bump on my, uh, on my face here. I thought it was a spot. Mm. Um, that turned out to be skin cancer. And uh, after having a biopsy to diagnose that it was, um, I then went for an operation where they cut it out effectively and I now sport underneath this makeup a scar that uh, is the, the surviving bit of the operation. And for me, you know, wearing that scar with pride is something that shows that I managed to beat cancer by doing it. But when you're in the public eye, especially when you're a politician, 
you know, you're very aware that quite often on TV, people are, well, the camera zooms in on what's going on here and having a scar across your face can make you feel, or certainly made me feel straight away, very vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, and uh, exposed. Mm -hmm. And cancer's horrible. And when you hear that you've been diagnosed with cancer, you think the worst. But having the operation that I did with the NHS, who were just simply brilliant, mm -hmm. looking after me at every stage, I think is a good reminder that, you know, you're not invincible. You do need to look after yourself. And especially in the public domain, you should try and model the behaviour. So if there are, if there is a bump or lump that you're not certain about, please go get it checked out. When it, I mean, it's great advice. And I have to say, actually, Alexander Amekopatis is amazing, but I would never have noticed, to be honest, from you. I, mean, I know that's maybe not the right thing to say, but you genuinely wouldn't, wouldn't notice at all looking at you. Well, it's actually... You, um, when I was on your show a while ago, it was actually one of the first interviews I did after the operation. Yeah. And uh, I was really concerned that people would... Uh, tweets about the, what's going on with his face, is there a scar there? And actually, um, I think being able to be open and honest about that, I think is a really important part of the healing process. But also there's people right around the country for whom having operations on parts of their body that are visible mm -hmm. means that they can't hide that away. They can't, they can't not tell that story. Mm -hmm. And I think just being able to talk about it, I think is an important part of, you know, my healing process, but also hopefully giving, um, giving more courage to others to be able to do the same. With um, cancer, it's a word that is really frightening. Mm. What happened when you were first told that you did have cancer? You think the worst. Mm. I mean, you do. I mean, the, the sentences after I've got cancer was a little bit garbled in yeah. my mind, thinking yeah. back on it because you're thinking, OK, if I've got it on my face, where else could it be? You know, I've only had a biopsy on my cheek. What happens if it's inside me elsewhere? Um, what happens if this is the end? What will happen to my family? Uh, and so you do worry about that. And I think that's a, that's a reaction that is very common for lots of people to have. Um, I was worried about you know, what this means for my job, whether I'd have to take time off, because there's only one Member of Parliament for the bit of Plymouth that I represent, mm -hmm. and if I'm not doing it, there's no-one to step in, there's no uh, relief, there's no-one that can uh, sub you in or out. So I was concerned about just what the impacts would be, but having, you know, uh, a nurse be able to talk you through, OK, this is what it means, this is what we need you to do, mm -hmm. this is how we want you to look after yourself, and unusually, having spoken to... Uh, the whips in Parliament. Now, the whips in Parliament often don't get the best reputation as, as enforcing party discipline. That's true, yeah. <laughs> but they were very frank and honest. They said, well, we've had members of Parliament with cancer. We know that you will work too late. We know that you'll try and come back to work too early. And when you do feel tired, because you will do, we want you to know that you can, you know, take the time that you need. And actually, I think that's important because... People in the public domain are still people at the end of the day. And if I'm trying to model best behaviour, working myself into the ground to show that uh, it's the right thing to do, it's the wrong thing to do. And I think, you know, we all need to take time to look after ourselves because if we can't look after ourselves, we're not actually then able to look after others. Well, I hope you took your other half out for a decent meal to say thank you for making you go to the doctors and to oh, the absolutely. GPs in that yes. uh, circumstance yeah. as well. Um, I'm interested to know a bit about how you found your experience with the NHS, because mm. we talk about the NHS an awful lot in the abstracts, um, whether it is waiting times or um, A&E times, mm. ambulances, et cetera, et cetera, funding, budgets. What's your first-hand experience of it like? Well, I've always found the most overriding experience that I've had with the NHS, whether I'm waiting mm. or not, is just the staff. Mm. It's the staff that greet you at reception, uh, you know, dealing with a waiting room full of ill and sick people and worried people. Uh, the doctors that did the surgery on me, and my surgery was under local anaesthetic, so they were having a chat with me at the same time, them talking about what this operation meant and keeping me calm. And that's the type of work that takes place day in, day out in our National Health Service. And I think when you look at the figures around the people are waiting, the 7.4 million people on an NHS waiting list, the highest it has ever been, well, that's a level of figure that it's really hard to understand. That's one in seven people. That means nearly, in nearly every single family, there's somebody in the country who's waiting on an NHS waiting list. And actually, I'm sure our viewers, if you think about it, there'll be someone that you can think of right now waiting for an appointment. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the worry that you have when you're waiting about is the issue that you're going in to see 
a doctor or a nurse about going to get worse in the meantime? Mm -hmm. Will it be treated? Is it, it going to be caught early enough? That is, you know, that weighs on you. And it is that kind of stress which is contributing to people not participating in the workforce. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons that we're not having the growth that we need is because there's so many people who are on a waiting list who aren't able to then to go back to work or get the treatment they need to, you know, work properly. I, I'm interested today because, look, we spent an awful lot of time on today talking about how great the NHS is, mm. right, reflecting on it. Is it that great? And do we actually need to start having, I guess, a more honest conversation about the failings of the NHS? I think you can do both. I mean, the NHS, a system that provides healthcare free at the point of need, so you don't have to worry about how much money is in your wallet, is a system that we should be really proud of. And when that was first introduced 75 years ago, that fundamentally changed the health outcomes for millions of people, not having to save up, scrimp and save, to go to the doctors to work out who was going to get the appointment in their family. That makes such an incredible difference. But the health service now is broken, but the principle behind it isn't. And I think making the clear distinction about NHS should always be free at the point of need. I don't agree, and neither does my party, with charging people to go see a GP or charging someone to go to accident and emergency. I'm not sure how that would work. But well, should we use the private sector a bit more, do you think? Even if it is free at the point of use? Well, I think... Using the private sector to help deal with this incredible amount of backlog that we have seems to me an appropriate use of the private sector at the moment. I don't have private health care, and the vast majority of the constituents that I represent don't have private health care. They rely on the NHS. The key thing that people want is for their uh, health ailment to be dealt with efficiently and properly and quickly. And if using the private sector to reduce that huge backlog that we've got, just as Labour did last time we were in power, uh, in 1997 to 2010, using the private sector to reduce those waiting lists we inherited, well, at the end of those 13 years, we had the highest patient satisfaction uh, in NHS history and the lowest waiting lists. Now, 13 years of Conservative government later, we have the lowest satisfaction in the NHS, sadly, and the highest waiting lists. So it doesn't have to be like this. But at the end of it, when you're looking at the waiting list, when I'm looking at the figures for my constituency about how many people are waiting for care, well, each one of those is a person. Each one of those is someone like me or my other half or my mum who, you know, like any one of us, we just want the best for them. And at the moment, the NHS isn't delivering for what for the people that really need it because we have a broken health service. Now, that is not the fault of any NHS consultant or doctor or nurse or cleaner. It's the fault of the people who've been running the health service last 13 okay. years, and that's the government. Well, I mean, I'm sure they would say that there are other uh, issues, just put the, you know, the mm. other side of the story, you know, whether it's the COVID or whether it's um, funding as well. Um, interesting to talk. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with the NHS as well. I think it's really important today actually to reflect on what people's experiences are and I'm sure there'll be lots of people who have scars in particular who'll be thinking it's been refreshing to hear someone talk about that on TV so thank you. Thank you. Um, the other story I want to talk to you uh, today is just a point at Wimbledon mm -hmm. uh, right and um, lots of people will have seen this story. Um, what is your take on this? Do you think that actually they're getting their message across, it's just interrupted a tennis match, who cares? Or do you think actually they might be turning people off by doing this? Well, I'm an environmentalist. I've led Labour's environment uh, team for a number of years. I believe that we're in the middle of a deep climate crisis and we've got to take urgent action. I also believe there's not a single extra person who has been convinced of the need for urgent action because of the disruption that Just Stop Oil are causing to people. We need to take people with us. To make the case for the urgent action that's required, it's not just low-hanging fruit like loft insulation we need to put in place. There needs to be fundamental change in our economy, uh, and that does require any government to be able to take the public with them. I don't think the disruptive protests that we're seeing from Just Stop Oil are doing that. If anything, I think it risks turning people against the urgency of the actions that are actually required. So, yes, we should be making the case that climate change is causing significant problems and we'll, those problems will get worse. But if the way we're doing that is for con uh, convincing the people we need to believe that, to believe the opposite, then I think we are harming our own future and I'm not convinced these tactics are going to work. Um, Labour want to spend £28 billion a year on the green economy. There'll be some people who look at that and thinking, you know, given the conversation we've just been having about the NHS, there'll be hospitals crying out for investment, there'll be people who are desperate to move up that waiting list. Is spending £28 billion a year on the green economy really the right thing to do in those circumstances? 
I think it is. And Rachel Reeves, our Shadow Chancellor, has set out that by halfway through the next Parliament under a Labour government, we hope to be spending around £28 billion a year. Well, that's not just money spent in the abstract. That's money spent on home insulation, complete retrofits, street by street. It's on turning Britain into a clean energy superpower, really taking the renewables to its possibilities, investing in nuclear, and making sure that we are moving our steel industry to I guess green steel. All these these things, are all jobs. They all sound really important things, mm. but why? some people might say, why don't you spend £25 billion a year on that and spend £3 billion on, on our hospitals, for example? Well, Labour set out a plan already to spend more on our National Health Service by abolishing the non-DOM tax status. How much is that, though? £2.6 is that right? So it's billions a year. I mean, I mean that's, to... that's nothing in comparison to £28 billion on the green energy revolution, as you say. No, but we're already spending a large amount on the National Health Service, and I think it's what we're looking at. Uh, where, where the money goes matters. That's doubling the number of medical, spa uh, medical uh, school uh, spaces, uh, 10,000 extra nurses and midwives, and that will make a, a difference to the way the NHS works. But we can't ignore the fact that if we don't invest in cleaner, greener technologies, not only will we not be able to avert the worst parts of the climate catastrophe that's facing us, we'll also be missing out on the jobs in the green economy of the future because there will be a country that will be leading on hydrogen there will be a country uh, in Europe that'll be leading on clean energy but why can't that be Britain and I think we need to be backing ourselves here there are investors all around the world that want to invest in these new technologies that want to invest in Britain I think we should be bolder about standing up and saying actually I want those jobs to come to Britain I want those jobs in the southwest of England where I represent looking at how we can decarbonize our energy system how we can create more highly skilled decently paid jobs in that process now that's what the 28 billion pounds a year means to me I know it's uh, an insult that the government keeps throwing around but actually I think they're downplaying Britain's future every time they do that. We should be investing in clean, green jobs for the future. This is investing in careers for our children and our grandkids so they can form in the future and live on a planet that's not in flames. OK, thank you very much. It's been great to have you on the programme today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, Labour's uh, Luke Pollard there, talking about the NHS and also, of course, those Just Stop All protests uh, that we've been covering today at uh, Wimbledon. Well, today on the programme, we're talking about the NHS, and it really is a brave politician who would say anything too critical about the NHS, although we did hear that it was broken uh, in our last interview, particularly on a day, of course, when it marks its landmark 75th anniversary. But what does the public think? Our data and forensics correspondent Tom Cheshire reports on the soaring levels of public dissatisfaction with the service they're getting. The first line of the NHS constitution says that it belongs to the people. So what people think about it and the service they get from it is crucial. A new poll from Ipsos exclusively for Sky News shows that they don't think much. And because we ask the same questions internationally, we can compare that to how 16 other countries think about their own healthcare systems. Take our first question. Over the coming years, do you expect the quality of healthcare that you and your family will have access to will improve, stay the same or get worse? In the UK, almost half said they expect the NHS to get worse over the coming years. Only the French and Hungarian publics were more pessimistic. Compare that to Australia, only 29% thought it would get worse, or Japan at the bottom, where it was only 14%. When we asked people whether they thought their health service was overstretched, 83% of the British public thought it was. That's the highest of any of the countries we asked. Now, you might object that this reflects a particularly British miserabilism in our attitudes. And we do tend to be a bit eerish about predictions while being positive about the current standard of care. But that has changed. Satisfaction in the NHS has plummeted since the pandemic. Here in 2018, the British public were more satisfied with their health care than people in any of the other countries we polled. But each year, the UK has been slipping further down the ranks. And much of that feeling is related to waiting lists. The survey results show that 76% of Britons think waiting times are too long. Again, the third highest share of any country. And that's the perception. This is the actual data of waiting lists. And you can see them going up. Every country around the world, they postpone elective procedures to free up beds. That's what's happening over here. The difference is that they're then levelled off like Sweden or they fell like Ireland in green. Instead, look at that red line. That is England and it keeps rocketing upwards. The waiting list now 80% greater than it was compared to the same month in 2019. And there's a pretty clear consensus among the public about why the NHS is in trouble. Here are the top three reasons. Lack of funding, staff shortages and poor government policy. People notably didn't blame immigration or NHS strikes or the increased cost of treatment. 
The NHS has faced pressure of some sort for all of its 75 years. But look at the data and the public's perception. The last few have been particularly acute. Oh, really interesting. That was Tom Cheshire there crunching through the numbers of public perception of the NHS. Um, we're joined by our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who's here with us this evening. The, N oh, the NHS, I mean, there's just so much to say on it, isn't it? Where to begin? It feels to me like it's only recently that we're starting to have an honest and open conversation about the state of the NHS. I'm not sure if you feel that as well. Um, it's almost been one of those public institutions where there's so much feeling around it, so much history to it that it's been almost beyond criticism. But now, you're kind of looking at some of the reality of what people are experiencing, the number of people on waiting lists, and the experiences that people have if they turn up at A&E or try and call their GP at 8 a.m. And suddenly, everyone's talking about it. That's right, and here we are on the 75th anniversary. I thought it was quite apt in a funny way that the politicians, in order to mark the 75th birthday of the NHS, skipped over the road to Westminster Abbey to have a, a service. <laughs> they went to pray for it because <laughs> Actually, policy solutions are in quite short supply. I, I, I mean, to give you one fact about the NHS worth bearing in mind, 38p in every pound spent on the state is spent on the NHS. So, yes, there are funding gaps, but already an enormous amount is spent on the NHS. And because of the ageing population, uh, it, 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 you know, it is hard to work out how you're going to generate enough money uh, to continue to do so, to provide the kind of service that people want. I'm not sure if you just saw that. Suddenly our camera just seemed to uh, just magically disappear. But we're back in the room. Uh, if, if, if you did that at home, we're here, don't worry. <laughs> uh, maybe it was the press for the NHS suddenly setting something off somewhere. No one's happy about us talking about it in this way. Um, where are the different parties on the NHS? Because I think it's quite interesting to listen to Labour. I mean, Luke Pollard there saying the NHS is broken. Yes, we do need the private sector to help us cut down waiting lists. It feels like there's a conversation going on in Labour that perhaps we don't associate with the Labour Party. That's right, but at the moment the Labour Party solution is to talk in very, very general terms about maybe more private sector involvement in the NHS. That's Wes Streeting's line. He, of course, is probably one of those figures on the right of the party as Shadow uh, Health Secretary. Actually, kind of sotto voce, quite a lot of Tories admit that there are big problems and because of the pressures from new technology and the ageing population uh, and problems with social care, uh, that they admit there are problems too and they're fairly candid about it. The truth is, Sophie, two things. First of all, as Maria Caulfield rather bravely admitted earlier today, things are going to get worse when it comes to waiting lists before they're going to get, back, uh, get better. And secondly, the reality of British politics, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the hour, but the reality of British politics is there is no money left. There is no money left. The economic situation of this country is pretty dire and therefore magic money trees have fallen over and died at the moment. And at the moment, that, that option, which is how Labour got out of this uh, problem with the NHS uh, when they were last in power, uh, just isn't available. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? What would a Labour government do without the money that they had the last time round? Uh, big question. Uh, Sam, thanks very much. As Sam was saying, we'll have more from Sam uh, later in uh, the hour. Uh, you're watching The Take. We're live in Westminster. Up next, we are going to be looking at what the government is doing in reaction to those allegations from Nigel Farage that his bank shut down his account because of his political views. Trusted place for news. 
the roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of North East Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Well, there's been plenty of talk about banks at Westminster recently because of the mortgage crisis, of course. But for one prominent figure, it's become quite a personal issue after the former Brexit party leader Nigel Farage claimed his bank, Coots, closed his accounts because of his political views. Well, the Treasury Minister, Andrew Griffith, has today written to the Financial Conduct Authority demanding an urgent review of what the industry calls politically exposed persons, or PEPs, a term I've never uh, heard of before this story broke. Well, our Chief Political Correspondent, John Craig, is here. I mean, this is quite an extraordinary story, isn't it? What, what's going on? What we've learned today, actually, is this, this affects a lot more people than just Nigel Farage. I mean, it, what sounds like a silly row between him and his elite bank, Coots, uh, he says they're dishonest, they say he hasn't got enough money. I've just come from a gathering of MPs where an MP's told me she couldn't get a mortgage because she was an MP. Uh, Ed Davies has been writing in The Times today about how it's affected him and many others. And it seems that it has affected a lot of politicians. Now, people may say, well, who cares about them? But uh, it's, uh, it's growing as a problem. It's not just politicians, because these PEPs, politically exposed persons, I've not heard of that phrase until this week. Um, they are, I can tell you who they are, they are MPs, peers, the military, diplomats, senior civil servants, councillors, people in local government and so on. Now, what the banks do with these politically exposed persons, they, give, they subject them to much stricter checks because they're worried about money laundering, bribery and all that sort of stuff. So, as you say, Mr Griffith has written to the financial watchdog saying, sort this out. Now, he says in his letter, uh, while I recognise the importance of ensuring that appropriate measures are in place, uh, to prevent money laundering, it's crucial that an appropriate balance is struck and that these measures do not unduly burden or prevent democratically elected individuals, public officials or their respective families from access to essential banking services. And he goes on to say, the government is clear that domestic PEP should be treated in a manner which is in line with their risk and that banks should not be closing individuals' accounts solely due to their status as a PEP. Now... Lord Vasey, as he now is, Ed Vasey, he's written a piece in The Times today uh, where he talks about his... He says, my 85-year-old mother was asked to declare her casino winnings, if only. He says, I was threatened with the withdrawal of my bank account, my credit card was cancelled. It's happened to dozens of people I know. I can't get so my head around this. It's a wider this. problem than we thought. 
Um, David Davis has joined the row. He's uh, saying to Mr Griffith tonight, uh, you need to do more. Typical David Davis, I guess. Um, he, and he says we should change the politically exposed person's policy. He says we have inherited it from the European Union. And it's very oh, badly... Brexit. Here we go. Yeah, I know. Well, he, well, perhaps he would say that. But I think, uh, having talked to a lot of other MPs about this this evening, I think he's, he's correct about that. Um, it's badly drawn, doesn't distinguish between domestic and foreign PEPs. He says, I know of no domestic PEPs who've been involved in terrorism, money laundering or other issues uh, supposedly covered by this legislation. So he wants families excluded. It's wrong that the children of politicians are restricted from doing normal things such as opening a bank account simply because of the career of their parents. And banks should not be allowed to cancel accounts without explanation. So we await what the Financial Conduct uh, Authority is going to do about it. I mean, personally, I think these, some of these watchdogs are pretty toothless and useless, aren't they? But it seems as though the Treasury is on their case and they've been told to get on with it and sort this out. So let's wait and see. Well, because just... the banks, you know... They're already, as you say, they're already under fire, not paying savers as much as they should in interest and all sorts of other uh, rip-offs of customers. And, well, it looks as though they're treating our poor politicians uh, badly as well. Poor things. <laughs> Tiny smile in there for you, uh, John. Although I have a feeling Nigel Farage is not going to let this one drop. You can see something uh, perhaps happening as a result Well, there's a clear dispute here. I mean, uh, as, as he, he says they're being dishonest, they say he's not got enough money. I mean... Coots is a very elite bank. You have to be pretty rich to bank with it. I don't. Do you? Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Soon will. We, do, we need to give, a, give someone a ring at Sky, I think. Uh, John, thank you very much uh, indeed. Great to have John uh, on the take. Uh, you are watching us this evening, 9pm Sky News. It's The Take. We're live in Westminster for you. Up next, we're going to be talking to the TSSA union about the plans to shut down railway ticket offices. And we'll also be taking the part of public opinion ahead of some crucial by-elections with Joe Twyman from Delta Pol.
welcome back live to Westminster. You are watching The Take. What the opinion polls, I don't tell you, uh, continue to make grim reading for Conservative MPs. They may stoically claim that the only poll that matters is the general election, but after changing leader twice in the last year, they are no further towards rebuilding their public support. And of course, there are some pretty crucial by-elections coming up that will demonstrate whether that polling reflects the reality on the ground. Well, Joe Twyman, the co-founder of and director of Delta Poll, uh, joins us in the studio. Um, Great to have you here. So talk us through these by-elections. What, what have we got coming up? Well, I would say the best way to think about it is almost like a computer game. Level one for the government is defending South Ryslip and Uxbridge. That will probably be the arguably the easiest thing for the opposition. They'll come in and, uh, and hope, to, uh, hope to win there. Next up is Somerton and Froome, which is a, a 19,000 majority. And, a, uh, and that sounds quite a lot, 19,000. It is quite a lot, and, uh, uh, but it's a constituency that previously the Lib Dems held between 97 and 2015. And ordinarily, you would expect 19,000 to be more than enough mm. of a buffer. But these are not ordinary times. At Delta Poll, our latest voting intention put the Conservatives 23 points behind Labour. If that were replicated at a general election, it would mean that all of these by-election seats would go. And so it's quite a, quite a challenge for them to hold on to any of them. But level three is, uh, is I think, the most interesting. Selby and Ainsty, a 30,000 majority, in excess of 30,000 majority, in a seat that historically has been Conservative for some time, if the Conservatives can't hold on there, it raises a real question about where they can hold on. And it also, in going into the summer, hands enormous momentum to Labour, Lib Dems and the other opposition parties. 30,000 majority. I mean, that is a, that's a safe seat, isn't it? Uh, well, it you be. would think it certainly should be. And, uh, and I think that if they aren't hold on to any of them, then that would be, would be obviously the one. The, uh, the one. But holding on to a 30,000 seat majority and spinning that as a victory, I think, demonstrates the, the size of the hole that the Conservatives are in at the moment when it comes to the polls. And what does your polling say is the reason for that? You know, is it the state of public services? Is it because people just don't really like Rishi Sunak? Are they it, taken by Keir Starmer's Labour Party? What, what is it? Inevitably, it's a combination of many of these things. But the most important thing for so many people is the cost of living. Mm. Uh, more than seven in ten people saying it's the most important issue facing them and their families. And so if the government is unable to come up with any kind of solutions that actually resonate with the public, that they actually see as being helpful to them, that's a real problem. And then when you throw in the other issues, it's, uh, it just makes things more difficult. But I think overall the problem that Conservatives have is one of distraction and division. And these by-elections simply add to that. The Conservatives are going through a period of infighting at the moment, whether it's about Boris Johnson or many uh, of their other specific policies. And united parties do well at elections, divided parties really don't, and they come across as very divided at the moment. And also, all of these events distract from the government being able to get policies across and actually cutting through with the members of the public. I guess the big question is the general election, right? the only poll that matters, as we're always told. Um, how is it looking for Labour? How easy or difficult is it for them to get a workable majority? Well, there are a number of different ways to look at this. If you look at it in historical terms, the challenge that Labour faced to get just a majority of two remains enormous. It's estimated that the swing in the vote that they will require will be close to what Tony Blair achieved in 1997, which is also the largest swing that a party has achieved in post-war history. If they're to get a workable majority, so beyond simply two, then the swing will be far beyond what has ever been achieved. In, uh, in, in British polling history. And so that's an enormous challenge. But also, there's a year, potentially even 18 months, until that election takes place. And it was only a year last week that Boris Johnson was talking about actively thinking of a third term. So a huge amount could happen in the time between now and the general election. But even though they have a strong position in the polls at the moment, you would, by historical standards, expect that to contract and that challenge facing Labour remains enormous. So, in other words, you think the most likely outcome is there for if the polls are to be relieved, a Labour minority government starting to talk to different parties, perhaps? Well, the polls are only ever a snapshot of where we are at the moment. Looking at the historical precedent and what would be required, not now, but perhaps autumn next year, suggests that perhaps some degree 
of minority governments is the most likely option. But a lot can happen between now and then. Things could get much better for Labour, they could get much worse. Are people convinced by Keir Starmer? He has, at the moment, net positive, uh, positive ratings. That means more people think he's doing a good job than think he's doing a bad job. And he's well ahead of Rishi Sunak on that, who's increasingly heading downwards and, in our most recent polls, was at an all-time low. But Keir Starmer is not Tony Blair in 1997, or, crucially, Tony Blair from 94 to 97. And he'll be wanting to improve his own personal position in the hope that that will help that huge challenge ahead. Uh, really interesting to talk. We'll have to um, get you on again to sort of talk us through the polling as that all-important election uh, edges closer. And, of course, we're going to have those critical by-elections too. Joe, thank you very much uh, indeed. Now, rail companies have announced their plans to shut down nearly every ticket office in England, leaving passengers no choice but to use vending machines or purchase online. Now, the Rail Delivery Group insists the closures are the next step in modernising the railway. But as our correspondent Aisha Zahid found out, for some, it's a step in the wrong direction. For Richard Holmes, the closure of ticket offices could make railways even more inaccessible. He's partially sighted and knows all too well how difficult it can be when there's no ticket kiosk. I find it uh, an, an unusable machine to activate my ticket, so I have to get help from a family member or, or a member of staff. Not many people go out independently as it is, so this is just another potential huge variable that will come into play. The Rail Delivery Group plans to close the majority of ticket offices in England. It says it's all about cutting costs and modernising customer service, but not all customers are happy. I have a computer at home, I can use it, but a lot of my friends haven't got a computer. How do they get their tickets? Use the ticket machine. Have you ever tried to use one of those ticket machines? They're, they're awful to use. Obviously, I get that lots of places would like to go paperless and things like that, but yeah, for the older generation, it's not ideal. It's fair on the young generation who know how to work uh, the new technology. I don't think it's fair on, on the older generations. Without ticket offices, passengers will have to pay for their journeys by either buying tickets online, using the self-service machines, tapping their contactless card on the barriers, or by buying tickets from station staff either on the concourse or on the train itself. According to the Rail Delivery Group, ticket offices accounted for 85% of total sales in the 90s, but now they only sell 12% of tickets. Transport Minister Hugh Merriman says the closures will help with efficiency. The people that work in ticket offices are not being properly utilised, so we want to give them a more rewarding job uh, out on the platform, in the station, interacting with all passengers. There's no doubt it's a significant change, and for some it's going to make travelling by train that bit more difficult. Aisha Zahid, Sky News. Well, let's get some reaction to that, shall we, from Peter Pendle, who is the General Secretary of the TSSA Union. Thanks for being with us. Uh, so, so, what are your main concerns, then? Well, there's two aspects to this. Firstly, there's the consultation on the, the closure of the offices, and there's a statutory requirement for the uh, train operating companies to go through consultation with the, with the community, and that's, that's starting today. We're opposed to um, the closure of ticket offices for a, for a whole number of reasons, and uh, you know I can go uh, go through uh, those with you, and I can I can give examples um, if it, if it would be helpful. And so we're really hope, hoping that the community um, organisations, those that uh, represent um, uh, the elderly and the disabled and such like, will put their views in on the on the consultation. The second uh, aspect of it is how it's being uh, how it's being implemented. Now, we we took industrial action earlier on in the in the year, um, and we reached a, an agreement with the uh, train operating companies through the rail delivery group, um, and we. Part of that agreement, we stopped our industrial action. We said we had, we're still opposed to the um, uh, to the closure of the the offices, but. My members are not Luddites. They they realise that change needs to needs needs to come. So we made an agreement. We said we'll stop the industrial action. We won't take industrial action um, uh, in in ticket offices. The deal was that 
we would negotiate with them over the implementation of the changes. There would be no compulsory redundancies till um, December 2024. There would be voluntary severance and those that were redeployed, there'd be consultation uh, around that. Now, there was also a uh, pay award as, as, so, as part so, of the deal. So, so is it... Are you actually opposed to the ticket office closures then or is it just a redundancy that you don't No, like? no. We're opposed in principle to the to the uh, ticket office but closures. But if no one gets sacked, then you'll suck but, it up. But well, you know, it, but it, you know, if the if the change is going to happen, the change needs to be uh, needs to be done properly. Can I tell you my day this morning? So, uh, so, so that's the agreement. We haven't had any industrial action since TSSA. So my morning at eight thirty, I had a meeting with the rail delivery group, and that meeting said, "We're going to renew you go on the offer." We're, the, the deal's out the window, we're not, we're not going to do it. Um, so that's the score. By the time I got back to my desk, um, I had half a dozen emails from train operating companies saying that, um, that Section 188 notice is... Section 188 notice is what an employer has to do for formal consultation for redundancies. So we had a deal... So is it the redundant... It feels to me like it's more the redundancies that you're up in arms about. Like, I know you, in an ideal world, you probably like every ticket office to, to stay open. But really, is this about redundancies? Uh, it, it is, but it's also about... I mean, in principle, we yeah. think ticket offices should, should, should remain open. We think they're doing a service to passengers um, mm. and, uh, uh, you know, we're committed to, to keeping them open. We're pragmatic. We realise that there's Less going to be change. It, if there's um, going to be yeah. change, then it needs to, needs to be done properly. Now, now what, what, what the rail delivery group and the TOCs are saying is, well, we're going to move people out onto the concourses to and, and 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 they'll deal with you know they'll deal with members of the public uh, well well that might work and we can talk about that in, in in a moment but what faith can we have that in two or three years time they're going to come along and say well actually no if they've reneged on the offer that we did so in good trust faith as well. yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine what had happened if we turned round and said, we're reneging on the offer, we're going to have a ballot for industrial action? What questions would you be asking me then? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess my other point is, do you accept the need to save money when it comes to the railways? What, what, what's the public sub subsidy currently? Well, I'm, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I can't answer the that. Billions. What... It's 11 billion a year yeah. or something like that, right? I mean, that, that's an awful lot of money that people are spending, and that's not even when you take into consideration ticket prices as well on our railways. Do you accept the need to save money? I accept the need for um, efficiencies and for money to be spent effectively. Um, I'm not convinced that that's, that's what's happening at, at the moment. So... Ask the question, how much is going out of the railways into shareholders' profits, uh, shareholders' dividends? Oh, well, maybe if we, if we stopped that, we'd have more money to maybe keep some of the ticket offices open. Uh, you know, we, we're quite... We, we campaign on uh, bringing the railways back into, uh, into the public sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that would stop a lot of money leaking out of, out of the railways. So what's your next steps? Are you going to be striking? Well, um, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? My members are really very, very cross. I mean, I've had so many emails and uh, texts and, and such like, they're really very, very cross. Bit of a dilemma for us, though, isn't it? Because we want to keep the ticket offices open. So we don't want to take action that's going to close the ticket offices when we want to, we want to keep them open. So I'm going to have to go back to the members and, and see, what they, see what they want to do. It's, it's interesting interviewing you, because, to be completely honest with you, you're quite unlike most other union bosses that I've interviewed. Uh, you, and, and I mean this kind of genuinely, you, you come across as more mild-mannered, a bit more on, on the one hand, on the other hand. Do you worry that actually that could be taken advantage of a bit here? No, I can, I can do table thumping. I can did you? A, I did, can a bit, you? I, I did a bit of table thumping <laughs> earlier on this Wait, morning really? when we met did with you? the RDG, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got to be pragmatic mm. uh, and we, we've got to get, get through this. My members are really very, very cross uh, uh, about this and justifiably so. And 
And I think so. You're considering action. Is it, that would be fair, would it? Or uh, uh, we're going to have to con we're going to have to consider our, our strategy. The deal was we wouldn't take industrial action. They would do the things that I've outlined to you. They've reneged on that. We're going to have to go back and, and ha have a think about it. Um, but it's also, you know, members of the public, the community. There is the consultation, the statutory consultation um, on, on ticket office closures. And, and we'll be campaigning with colleagues uh, across the sector to make sure that there's a response and the government get the message very clearly back on that. Uh, thanks very much. It's been really interesting to talk. Thanks very much. Indeed. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, you're watching The Take. We are live in Westminster for you this evening. Up next, we're going to be rounding up everything we've heard, doing a bit of post-match analysis with our deputy political editor. I think they're trying to push women out of every aspect of public life and, and really make them prisoners in their own homes. And beauty salons are actually quite important because they're women only space where women can go and, and have community and have support. And, and this is happening in a context where the Taliban have not only banned women and girls from most education and most employment, but also completely abolished the whole system that had been set up to deal with, um, with domestic violence. So a beauty salon might be the only place that a woman could go to look for help. It's interesting because the Taliban, um, while they've pushed women out of most government jobs and most NGO jobs, they have been a, a little bit tolerant of women working in the private sector. And this seems like a sign that that too may be, um, may be being taken away from women, which would be their last access to income in a situation where the country is in a, a very dire humanitarian crisis. One of the things that's quite frustrating is that now almost two years after the Taliban takeover and after this crackdown has begun, we still see diplomats who, who have this idea that somehow if they say the right thing to the right member of the Taliban leadership or if they find the, the, the good Taliban and get them to talk to the bad Taliban, that, that somehow there's going to be a change. But what we see is actually the crackdown continues to intensify. Things are going in the wrong direction, and it's time for some, some more vigorous and, and new thinking about how the international community should respond. The damage that's being done to Afghanistan right now will, will take decades and, and generations to recover. And, and one thing that's important to say is that while there's this devastating harm to women and girls, there's also terrible harm happening to boys because the Taliban is, is gutting the curriculum. And so we'll have an entire generation of young people, girls and boys, who um, you know, have been raised in a way that's terribly harmful to them and to their country and to the rest of the world. I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's chief North of England correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Welcome back. Now, we've had such a packed programme this evening that we are nearly out of time, but Sam has promised me that he is going to give us the most important story of the day in 90 seconds. So take it away. Which is not enough time for you to argue. Let's bring the chart up uh, to start with. Today, Sophie, the government needs to do something important. It needs to raise £4 billion, borrow £4 billion in able to fund day-to-day -day spending. So they had to go out to the money markets and get that money. Now, this is the cost of borrowing. How much uh, the government had to pay in order to get 
uh, will have to pay in order to borrow that money. And it is at the highest rate it has been for 16 years. The government's having to pay more to borrow than it has because people are so worried about inflation, very worried about interest rates, so they're having to pay more. Now, this is having a massive impact. This is going to be the discussion topic for the next few weeks and months because it means, because we're going to have to pay so much in order to basically borrow money, that's less money uh, for public services, it's less money uh, for tax cuts, which is what uh, lots of Conservatives want, it's less money uh, for uh, public sector pay. 30 uh, seconds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for public sector pay. And all of this has a big knock-on effect. Uh, now, this rate is higher than it was in the mini-budget when Liz Truss took over. Uh, the government insists there's not a crisis. The currency isn't tanking like it did uh, in September. But there, with every percentage point that goes up, that costs an extra 20 billion counts. We're running out of money. Four billion pounds of borrowing every day. That's so, fine. Four billion pounds they had to borrow today, and it's costing a lot more. We're off. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> uh, fascinating stuff. Thanks for watching very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed for watching the take. I'm stumbling over my words now uh, because of the time pressure. I need to get a new job. Uh, thanks very much. Next up, it's Sky News at 10. <laughs>